Okay, uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, thank you for connecting to this call. We will um, proceed from Acts chapter 17 and, and see uh, all the different things that uh, are taking place as um, you know Paul and his team minister on their uh, second missionary journey. Uh, we'll pray before we get uh, into today's um, discussion. So uh, maybe Zeli, Zeli, would you like to lead us in prayer? Yes, sure, Pastor. Let's pray. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we come before your presence in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this brand new day. And yeah. we begin our session for today. I pray that Holy Spirit, you will continue on to guide us, lead us. Lord, bless Pastor Nancy as she teaches the word of God from the book of Acts, Lord. And also you bless each one of us who are in the class, Lord. You give us the spirit of wisdom and understanding so that we can grasp what our pastor is teaching today, Lord. We bless you, we honor you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so last week, as we were spending time following the second missionary journey of Apostle Paul, we saw that um, he went into the Macedonian region. And then we uh, saw certain key cities over there, such as uh, Philippi, uh, whom he affected. And then we uh, talked about Thessalonica, where there was much persecution. Uh, and yet there was a good outcome, a good fruit in the city of Thessalonica. Then we talked about a place known as Beria. Uh, and later on, we saw that uh, Paul leaves uh, Beria and he moves towards uh, Athens and uh, over there he goes alone. He asks Silas and Timothy to come after him but then he says you know you come quickly and so he's in uh, Athens and he's waiting there uh, and uh, we talked a little bit about Athens about the kind of place that it was the uh, intellectual capital of the world so to speak because so many philosophies were born there uh, great philosophers went to get trained in Athens so we were talking about all of those aspects um, and uh, we talked about certain teachings uh, that were uh, prevalent in Athens at that time uh, when Paul went. We said there was a, a philosophy which was termed as uh, Epicureanism, uh, which had to do with experiencing, um, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, pleasures in life and the fact that God did not care. So that's what the Epicureans believed. Uh, whereas Stoicism, another one, uh, said that uh, life came from uh, God and everything is, um, uh, everything is God. So it was a completely different kind of a teaching. So people were in the midst of new philosophies and they enjoyed something new each time it, it came up. So this is the environment into which... Um, Paul went um, and we know that in Athens, uh, we will read the passage, okay, but uh, in Athens, uh, another very special thing to note was their idol worship. So uh, there were several idols uh, that, you know, were uh, part of their uh, religious practices. So it is said there was a, a man called uh, Gaius Petronius Arbiter, who even said that in uh, Athens, there are more gods than men, you know, so you would, you, you have more, uh, a likely chance of bumping into more idols than a human being. So there were those many idols uh, in uh, Athens, and that was part of their um, belief. So talk about it, and they had an altar for that particular god. So those are the kind of people that we are talking about. Uh, so in this setup, what is Paul going to do? How is Paul going to engage? That's the question that we are uh, going to look at right now. Now, uh, Paul will try to find the most suitable place. Remember, in each city, we saw him going to the synagogue because that was the place of uh, um, the gathering of people. But right now, which place is uh, he going to pick? Because this is more of a Greek city. And uh, 
you don't really have uh, uh, you know large synagogues to go to and minister to people but we'll see that there are these spaces where people meet uh, to have their discussions and talk about their philosophies um, uh, and uh, he will pick one of these places so agora agora was a marketplace uh, in uh, athens where uh, people would come it was an open space of assembly where people would come and uh, you know where they would have their uh, political governmental as well as religious assemblies and uh, have their discussions they would uh, somebody who has an idea would come there and share their idea and uh, someone who has a question would also come in um, check you know about whatever they believe so the, the agora was a common place where uh, a marketplace where people generally had their discussions so now uh, paul finds one such place and uh, this place is known as mars hill okay mars hill or uh, uh, another uh, term is areopagus okay areopagus so he comes to this place of discussion and he starts his uh, talk there so let's quickly go uh, to acts chapter 17 and we will have to read through now that we have an idea of what exactly is going on where paul finds himself and uh, we have the question about how he is going to address this particular philosophical crowd so we have to read from uh, act 16 let's go on all the way till verse 34 so i would request one of us to volunteer and read this entire section please Yeah, verse sixteen onwards. Acts chapter seventeen from verse sixteen. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout person and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, "What will this babbler say?" Others, some he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him into Areopagus, saying, "May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest?" For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the strangers which were spend their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Marsville and said, "Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription." to the unknown god whom therefore you ignorantly worship him declare unto you god that made the world and all things therein seeing that he is lord of heaven and earth dwelt not in temples made with hands neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything seeing he gave to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men For to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him, and find Him through far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets have said. For we are also His offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is unlike, like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and men's device. And the times of his ignorance, God winked at, but now command all men everywhere to repent, 
because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained whereof he had given assurance and to all men in that he had raised him from the dead and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead some mocked and others said we will hear thee again of this matter so paul departed from among them how by certain man clave unto him and believed some among the which was the only seus the aeropagite and a woman named damaris and the others with them thank you for uh, reading that entire section uh, jafina uh, so we saw how paul he came to uh, uh, athens and over there as he stood in athens uh, the scriptures tell us that his spirit was provoked now remember the guidance of the holy spirit has been a very essential part of uh, the way things have taken place in the book of acts uh, the holy spirit led paul to go to macedonia the holy spirit led philip to go where he went uh, uh, and and therefore listening to the holy spirit is key uh, in this particular situation there is the there is the guidance of the holy spirit but the way in which the guidance comes is slightly different uh, so in the case of uh, philip we said that uh, he had he uh, got this prompt from god uh, which said overtake the chariot um, or in the case of ananias who went to pray for paul uh, god told him you know paul is here he's praying you go so there were words that were spoken to ananias so that was one way of communication that god used in this particular case we see that paul was provoked in his spirit so it's may not it's not necessarily some words or a passage that is being spoken to him but it is a sense or a feeling it's a spiritual sense that paul is experiencing so he goes to a city and the fallen state of the city uh is, is something that the holy spirit is awakening him to uh and you know that's a possibility so he goes to this so called great intellectual city and um, he should actually be very happy because he is a scholarly person and he probably knew the value of uh, uh, athens however uh, he goes into the city and he is sensing a provocation within him or you know provoked has to do with uh, a, a, like a uh, an anger a spiritual anger which is rising up within him when he saw the city it says and uh, given over to idols so as a preacher of the gospel he felt that people were unaware of uh, the truth of what god had done for them and how god had redeemed them and so in this greek uh, region yeah it was a responsibility that paul carried to preach the gospel and to let them know about the love of god uh, now uh, he picks the place that he prefers as we said earlier yes there are synagogues but then in this particular place there uh, are market places as well okay so the market place uh, which i mentioned earlier agora was the place where a lot of people came uh, business was done discussions happened uh, and so he felt that that might be uh, another additional uh, stop for him to go to to speak to the greeks here so he went there he ministered and uh, you see that there were philosophers all over the place there were people who were uh, part of the epicurean and the stoic uh, um, thoughts of uh, you know a line of thought and uh, they came to him and notice what they say what does this babbler want to say why do you think they said babbler yeah so we've already been saying that it's a very intellectual city so uh maybe some of them had an idea about paul and his teachings and they just felt that there was nothing unique about the message that he is preaching and they assumed that this man is uh, uneducated uh, uh, not equipped uh, not 
necessarily a learned man and you know he's coming and sharing with us uh, some very uh, you know basic very simple not interesting uh, thoughts and so that's why they put him down and they did not consider him as an equal as an intellectual and uh, one thing though uh, that they noticed was that he was proclaiming about foreign gods uh, because this this knowledge about jesus was something that they were not uh, fully familiar with so uh, maybe you know there was something within them that said uh, we need to find out more about this jesus uh, so because he was proclaiming about jesus they directed him to the largest space that they had uh, where they could um, have these discussions and we would consider this particular uh, you know place or arena where they took him um, as we could call it like something like the city council so they went to the city council that would be where all kinds of discussions would be heard um, and uh, so they gave him a platform over there we already mentioned the name of the place areopagus or mars hill uh, and uh, they asked him the question may we know what is this doc new doctrine of which you speak uh, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. And for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there, spent time, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. So uh, it was just the reason why Paul got an opportunity was because what he was sharing was unique, and they wanted to give it a chance. So. In such a situation, you know, it's an intellectual city. Uh, how is Paul going to present the gospel? So uh, a lesson or two about preaching, a lesson or two about, um, you know, evangelizing in context. We can learn that from Paul in Athens. So he finds himself in the best place uh, because uh, he's given an opportunity to share his uh, faith. But look at this. You know, sometimes they say that we need to communicate the the uh, unfamiliar from the familiar. So that's the approach that he takes up. So he just comes to them and he says, uh, you know, I saw this inscription to the unknown God. Or there seems to be an altar to the unknown God. Uh, you know, do you want to know this unknown God? I am proclaiming about this unknown God. So that caught their attention. They felt that, okay, yes, we do have uh, an altar for the unknown God, but we don't know anything about this unknown God. Maybe we should listen to Paul. And then he begins to talk. Then he begins to paint the picture of a creator God. Though so he says things like God who made the world and everything in it. So you notice in this society where uh, people probably did not have the full understanding that God is a creator and then there are created beings, he had to let them know that uh, we must worship the creator, uh, right? And so that is why he's beginning to speak in this way so that they can have some understanding about who God really is and what is the right way of worshipping him. And then he goes on. He says, uh, 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 he nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath and all things. So he is, you know, uh, letting them know that God is above everything. And then he goes on uh, to talk about, you know, salvation through Jesus Christ, where he begins to teach them, you know, about how uh, God is the one who uh, uh, will judge the world with his righteousness, uh, by a man whom he has ordained. So he's actually talking about the Lord Jesus. Uh, and then, you know, he uh, gives them the assurance that uh, God will also raise uh, his people from the dead. So let us see what are the themes which are running through Paul's message here. One is that God is a creator. Secondly, he talks about Jesus. He talks about the fact that there will be judgment through this man, Jesus Christ. He also talks about the resurrection of the dead. So he covers a lot of key points, uh, bringing it in a, in a nice way to the audience. Now, another uh, way in which he actually... Uh, 
uh, speaks this message is notice. Okay, at one point he actually says, yeah, uh, verse 28, where he says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So, uh, Paul is a well-read man, so he may have uh, read about the philosophies of the Greek people. He may have read the poet, poems of the Greek people. So to get their attention, uh, he's being very intellectual in his message also. Now, if you go back to uh, people like Peter, when they preach uh, in uh, uh, you know Acts 2, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, uh, Peter goes into uh, the patriarchs, he goes into Abraham, he goes into Moses, he goes into David. Why? Because that's the context which the Jews will understand. But look at the message of Paul here. It's so different. There's no Abraham, there's no Isaac, because the audience will not understand. So what will the audience understand? The audience will, uh, uh, they, they are looking for a new philosophy. So he introduces it like that about Jesus, but he covers all the important points, you know, about repentance and judgment and uh, resurrection, Christ, all that. But you notice he also puts in a little bit of their own poets. So it's in context. So then the Greeks will, will uh, wake up to the message. So in this way, he tries to preach to them. And he uh, tells them that this unknown God uh, is the Lord Jesus Christ and that you need to make a uh, place for him. And then this is just a starting point from where he wants to preach Jesus to them. Uh, however, notice in every city he had a little bit of a positive reaction and a somewhat of a negative reaction. So the same thing happens here in Athens. We see that the moment he mentioned resurrection of the dead, for some of the intellectuals there, they felt that uh, this is not this is not uh, intelligent. This is not uh, acceptable. Okay, this philosophy is not nice, and so uh, people started mocking him. You know, how can the dead rise? Uh, and uh, they mocked him. They shut him down uh, and then they just said that okay stop it Paul uh, we will hear you at another time okay so Paul uh, had to stop speaking what he was speaking and uh, he went from there now uh, thank God there was a, a response from people they accepted Christ and there were some believers even in this great city of Athens so uh, you know Luke writes about them he says uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite. So maybe like a well, well uh, recognized, uh, an influential person because Areopagite means somebody from the city council. So Dionysius was one such person. Uh, there's also Damaris and others with them. So one beautiful thing is that there was a church planted in Athens. Okay. And we are happy about that. But uh, beyond this, you know, Paul was not able to do much in Athens and then he just had to move on to the next place. So uh, if you have any thoughts or questions, uh, please feel free. You can you can just discuss. So the gospel is for uh, the common man, the layman and the intellectual person and everyone else. Yes, the way we present it might change from time to time because we are looking at them accepting it, right? Uh, but the message is the same and the message is there for everyone. So uh, that's the beauty of the kind of ministry that Paul engaged in. He was going to all kinds of people all over the place. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I was yeah. just reading as her teaching. So in uh -huh. verse twenty six, it says uh -huh. he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. So uh, this one blood, as it signifies, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Or what's okay? Like as far as uh, you know, my understanding goes, I think it's referring to uh, us being the Adamic race. 
because we are all our lineage goes back to adam right so i don't i don't think he's referring to the blood of jesus so right now uh, paul is in athens he's alone he did the ministry alone uh, but who is he waiting for to join him correct so timothy uh, and silas are yet to join him so let's see now how uh, what exactly happens and where he plans to go okay he does have a a, a small number of people who are believing in athens and then he has to move on from there so the next stop would be corinth okay now these are all uh, very important cities because something about the strategy of paul he went to places where there was a lot of movement these were business cities and uh, from such a city where uh, you know a lot of people could come in go out the gospel can move faster uh, and maybe that's why he picked uh, all these you know high five cities he could have gone to smaller cities one challenge is that reaching them would have been difficult for him uh, but the other thing is he was being strategic and he was sharing the gospel in a place from where it can easily touch many many parts of the world so that's the reason he picked these cities so athens we saw very prominent city and now he's choosing corinth okay now corinth again uh, is a uh, in those days uh, today we call certain cities metropolitan cities where it's multicultural people come from different parts of the nation different parts of uh, the uh, world and they make their habitation there a lot of business happens um, there's uh, education there's all kinds of infrastructure uh, for for people to really thrive so metropolitan cities so corinth was one such metropolitan city it was also a port city uh, closer to the sea uh, and thereby you know uh, it had harbors and the ships could come in uh, it was a booming commercial center uh, in those days so uh, think about it you know paul and his vision was so big uh, his dream was so big he was not afraid he was ready and bold to go into a city like corinth uh, and uh, trust god to impact that city so he went there uh, and uh, apparently uh, it was also known as the ornament of greece so uh, athens is a special place but then corinth is a sort of a more special place uh, so it was known as the ornament of greece so it had some uh, 200000 uh, people living there and uh, the speciality of uh, corinth the speciality of athens is intellectualism of corinth was actually worship okay and the worship of a particular god known as aphrodite uh, they had a huge temple for uh, uh, act- this is a goddess actually uh, aphrodite the goddess and this temple uh, was known for its uh, architecture because uh, it, it it was huge like something like 1750 feet uh, high and uh, uh, sorry i'll just come back to this it was set on a set on a height of 1750 foot and uh, uh, it staffed a lot of people so there were men and women who were worshipers in this temple uh, but one of the practices of uh, worship was prostitution so uh corinth in that sense uh, you know whenever people talk about corinth it is a sin city so uh the reputation of corinth was not very uh, good it was known for immorality and pleasure so at one hand uh it's a thriving booming city where paul wants to make an impact but at the same time you know corinth is a city where there is incredible immorality 
so it's going to be a challenge for paul to uh, do his ministry there uh, but then we find that you know uh, paul uh, stations himself there for about uh, 18 months so a year a year and a half uh, and by god's grace he also finds people good people who can partner with him in the ministry so we will read about the names of a couple uh, known as aquila and uh, priscilla who were jewish believers who had to leave uh, rome and come to corinth because of uh, a certain rule or a law which had been passed or an edict which was issued by the roman uh, emperor in those days so just temporarily they left rome and they were also in Corinth. Now, the common thing about Paul and Aquila and Priscilla uh, is that they were all tent makers. So they made their living by making tents. Uh, and uh, Aquila and Priscilla they get saved, and they also partner together with Paul in the ministry. So that's a beautiful thing that happens in Corinth. Uh, and at this point, you know, when uh, Paul is in Corinth, he also receives a small support from uh, Philippi. So people send him some financial help uh, from there, and he's grateful for that. Um, uh, the team becomes larger in Athens. He was alone, but over here he will find Aquila and Priscilla. But at the same time, his uh, old team, Silas, Timothy, uh, and also Luke, uh, will join him. For a little, for the ministry there. Okay, so these are all uh, a couple of uh, uh, key things regarding Corinth. Now we will read how exactly the ministry took place in Corinth. So uh, we can look at the passage that is given here and uh, understand what he does in Corinth. So we are in Acts chapter eighteen, and we would need to read up from verse one. Till verse seventeen. Who would like to read this passage? After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Colis, ah. and he found he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Prisca, Pris Priscilla. 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 Yes, because Claudia, Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for, by occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. With Silas and Timothy had, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the by the Spirit and te testified to the Jews that Jesus is the is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, "Your blood be upon your own heads. Um, I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles." And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justus, one who worshipped God, who, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with, with all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you, will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was proconsul of Aquila, Assyria, Assyria, the Jews with one cord rose up against Paul and brought him to judge to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be there would be reason why I should 
there would be reason why I sh should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourself, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Amen. Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lubega, for sharing that. Uh, I wanted to show us a picture of the Acro Corinth. So I still get confused whether the temple was 1,050 feet high or, you know, the Acro Corinth. But uh, I, I think the temple was built on a height. So uh, currently some ruins are, we can see some ruins. You can't really see the temple. So some difficulty I found a picture for us. Let me show you. Yeah, so I think you can see here, I'm just showing it off a web page. You can see it? Yeah, so these are the ruins of the temple. Um, and it was set on a height. And as we said, uh, there were uh, staff who were prostitutes, both men and women. And uh, the city as such was known for immorality. So even when Paul writes to the Corinthians, we'll see that he gives many uh, instructions about living a godly life, about living a sexually pure life. Uh, people were getting saved out of such a background, uh, you know, out of prostitution. Uh, and then he had to instruct them about uh, the right lifestyle for a believer. So, uh, uh, this is a little bit of background about uh, Corinth. It just gives us, you know, an idea about ancient uh, Corinth and how it was uh, at that time. Now we could, okay, yeah. So we could go on to understanding a little more about how exactly, you know, the, the ministry happens. So we saw that he comes to Corinth and he meets Aquila and Priscilla, as we mentioned, people from Italy or from Rome, uh, who were also tent makers. So this helps us understand that uh, Paul was... Uh, a very responsible individual. He did not, just because he was serving people in ministry, he did not put the burden uh, of, uh, you know, the cost of his living on them. So he did his best to uh, work with his hands and to provide for himself. And we see that he writes in certain passages that, you know, we did not burden you, we worked hard among you, and uh, like, you know, the way we lived among you. So uh, that's a good thing. It's a, a good example. And it's also an eye opener for some of us who may think that, uh, you know, ministry is only full time. And uh, if we do have a profession or a career uh, which is outside of the so-called typical full-time ministry, then something is wrong. But look at Paul. He was he was a tent maker or uh, he was a marketplace uh, minister uh, in a sense. So uh, it's okay to have work uh, and to do ministry. Okay. And uh, again, in Corinth, we find him doing the same thing. He goes to the synagogue every Sabbath where he begins to persuade or convince the Jews and the Greeks. Uh, and, uh, and again, we said that uh, his team is required here in Corinth. So Silas and Timothy come from Macedonia and uh, uh, Paul was compelled by the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So notice these are all the, the 
promptings or the leading of the holy spirit and uh, uh, though paul has his strategies uh, he is following the holy spirit and that is important for us in our lives as well you know all our planning should be done by hearing from god uh, and uh, we should continue to be open to what the holy spirit is saying to us so compelled by the spirit he begins to testify to the jews that jesus is the christ uh and what kind of you know response does he get we see that there is opposition even in corinth every city uh, a few people are believing but then you know there is opposition same thing happens here uh, but at this point paul is quite upset uh they Uh, he shook his garments and said to them your blood be upon your own heads i am clean from now on i will go to the gentiles so uh, what he does is if jews were not receptive of his ministry he just decides to put all his energy to those who will listen and so you know he uh, transfers his focus to the gentiles he goes to the gentiles so there is a man known as justice uh, you know who worships close to the synagogue so he goes there and uh, uh, you know he he begins to minister there but uh, there is an impact on even people from the synagogue because there is a man by the name of crispus who is the ruler of the synagogue who believed in jesus and many corinthians actually start to believe so certain gentiles believe and certain jews also believe but we also need to understand that this uh, environment of opposition it was not easy for paul you know somewhere we have this picture of paul that uh, here's a man who's so strong nothing mattered to him and uh, he he was bold uh, even when people were opposing him but maybe paul went through his own set of discouragements disappointments pain uh, and even fear look at god's goodness in paul's life verse 9 it's so precious uh, it says now the lord spoke to paul in the night by a vision a word of encouragement comes to him do not be afraid but speak and do not keep silent for i am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you for i have many people in this city so uh, as we serve the lord you see even god understands there are those moments when we really need to hear from god and uh, an encouragement from god and god is so gracious he says okay paul don't worry i know it's hard for you but you keep preaching i am with you I have a lot of people in this city nobody will attack you so uh, even in paul's journey there could have been phases where uh, you know he he was down uh, and god is we'll see again you know there'll be another time where the holy spirit will come and minister to him and say don't worry paul i'm with you you do the work okay so uh, depending on the encouragement of god is also so very precious so let's pause here we'll come back we'll continue uh, learning about the city of corinth okay thank you everyone